electronic data solutions. I work out of our Portland office. And today this webinar subject is using the Trimble Mapping uh, Geo7x uh, for GIS data capture using the laser rangefinder and a VRS real-time correction source and a single base correction source. And we will discuss the differences between those two and give you some idea as to what type of accuracy you can expect. This webinar will last approximately 35 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So let's see. Uh, so let's begin. Um, the first slide, a little bit about our company. Uh, Electronic Data Solutions uh, has been in business for 25 years. Actually, we celebrated our 26th year last year. And we offer a wide variety of hardware and software solutions. Everything that we sell and uh, support includes technical support, training, and repair services. Our home office is in Jerome, Idaho. And from that location, we have expanded into six different western states with currently eight locations and 26 employees. So our mission as a company is to help our customers find a solution to electronically capture and manage data from the field to the office. So let's talk a little bit about the new Trimble Geo7x. Uh, this unit was talked about in mid-November. It began shipping almost the last day of November last year, so it's only been on the market for about four and a half months. Uh, it does include a laser rangefinder module. And sort of as a side note, uh, more recently, within the last maybe 10 or 12 days, Trimble now offers this product without the laser rangefinder, so you can take full advantage of the features that you're about to hear uh, without having to purchase the laser if you don't need it. Um, all of these units include a built-in 3.5G cellular modem. That used to be an additional cost on the old 6000 series. And the nice thing about this modem, it's a universal modem, which means it can be activated on either AT&T or Verizon. If you decide to activate on AT&T, then you do need a SIM card, which AT&T will provide you free of charge. And then naturally, you have to sign up for a data plan. If you decide to activate on Verizon, you do not need a SIM card. You simply need to provide the electronic serial number of the modem to Verizon, and they will activate the modem based on your billing. Let's see, this unit has double the data storage capacity. The 6000 had a 2 gig storage. This one has 4 gigabytes of onboard storage. It will still accept up to a 32 gigabyte standard SD card for additional storage. This unit has a 1 gigahertz processor. The previous model had a 600 megahertz processor, so it is much faster. And the nice thing about this particular unit is Trimble now manufactures one single unit. And what that means on this particular series is that if you purchase the submeter version, later on you can decide to upgrade to the decimeter, or even later on you can decide to upgrade to the centimeter unit. Now, just to be clear, for those of you attending this webinar who are surveyors, uh, it does require an external antenna. It does require a range pole uh, and all the necessary uh, accessories if you plan on achieving a centimeter of accuracy in the field or post-processed. This is a pretty remarkable unit in that it is a multi-constellation multi receiver. So it's currently picking up any one of the 31 GPS satellites any one of the 24 active GLONASS satellites, which is the Russian constellation. Obviously, it picks up WAS, which is our correction service um, over the United States or North America. This one also picks up all the Galileo satellites, which is the European constellation. It also picks up the Compass system, which is the, the Chinese constellation, and the QZSS constellation, which is Japan's correction satellite system. So. It's really common to walk outside with this particular unit uh, in the open and pick up 24, 25 satellites. It's a pretty remarkable unit. Um, this unit provides what they call SBAS Plus. Now, many of you are familiar with SBAS, which is simply a satellite-based augmentation system. In this country, we use the WAS satellites to provide ourselves real-time corrections to anywhere from 2 and a half to 5 feet, depending on conditions. But SBAS Plus 
will not only provide corrections to GPS solutions, it'll provide corrections to the multi-constellation solution. And what I mean by that, many of you may have experienced this if you have a 6,000 receiver. Uh, you're looking at your sky plot and you see all of the GPS and Russian satellites in view. Then when you activate SBAS, which means you're now trying to re receive satellites, you'll go back to your sky plot and you'll notice that all the Russian satellites have disappeared. Now they're still being collected and stored in the data file but they're not being used to calculate a real-time position. So in this particular unit, it uses SBAS Plus, which means our WAS satellites can now apply corrections to all the satellites in view. So let's talk about some of the sensors. Now this all has to do, of course, with the laser rangefinder module. Uh, the laser rangefinder provides distance. The clinometer will provide vertical angle. The compass provides horizontal angles, so all three sensors are built in to what we're referring to as the laser rangefinder module. Uh, it's a very simple uh, calibration process. You can even calibrate the system in what we call the fast calibration mode with your eyes closed. It's simply a process of spinning the unit around in every direction until the software indicates that you have successfully calibrated the sensors. And then, of course, you do have to calibrate the laser as a separate process, which also takes just a few seconds. So if you can take a look at that screenshot, I know it's a little bit small, but this sort of shows all of the different functionality that the laser rangefinder module can perform. It performs almost the same functionality as a separate external laser rangefinder in that it can do a single point offset. It can do multiple point offset. It can do height calculations and it can also do missing line. So missing line is a great feature because the compass is available. You can shoot a point to your left, you can shoot a point to your right, and the system will calculate the distance and the basis of bearing between those two points. So it's actually solving for the third side of the triangle uh, in a horizontal orientation. So it's pretty intelligent. However, I must say this, most folks who purchase this unit with the laser rangefinder module are in fact using it primarily to do point feature offsets, which simply means you're collecting a point feature really that for whatever reason you're not able to occupy directly. So this is a really important issue because obviously if you're going to be offsetting point features, uh, you do have to be concerned with what kind of degradation of accuracy might occur by using these sensors. So the laser rangefinder is highly accurate. It's actually more accurate than most of the handheld lasers that you may have seen in the past. It's got um, a, a five centimeter plus or minus error, which is basically 1.9 inches. So it's a very accurate distance measurement. The clinometer is good to a half a degree. So your vertical angle up and down is good to 0.5 degrees. The biggest error in this particular module happens to be the compass error. So this is the biggest source of offset error. So you do have to be careful. Uh, a one and a half degree error is not very much at 20 feet, but it can be substantial at 100 feet. So you do have to be highly aware that the longer your shot is, the more error you're going to have in the final resting place of that point feature. You'll notice that the laser rangefinder can shoot 400 feet to any object. If you want to go farther than that, there does have to be some sort of a reflective device at the other end of your measurement, such as a piece of survey glass, uh, a bicycle reflector, um, some sort of a sign that may have reflective paint. But basically, you're going to keep your shots under 400 feet anyway, and so that should not be an issue. This has an integrated 5-megapixel uh, autofocus camera, as the previous 6000 had. And the nice thing is that the laser rangefinder uses the entire screen of the GPS data collector and the camera as the sighting device for the laser. <clears throat> so you can see that when you're activating the laser utility built into this unit, there's a red dot. And something that didn't translate to this particular screenshot for some reason there's also a white square which actually serves as your sighting area 
Uh, and the white square is typically surrounding the red dot, which is directly in the center of that square. And that proves or confirms to the user that you're actually shooting the right object. So I'm actually pointing at a wall when you see this gray screen. But in real life, out in the field, you would see the trunk of a tree, you would see a sign, you would see whatever it is you were pointing at. And you'll also notice, and this is something that we couldn't show in the webinar, but you'll also notice as you move the laser around or as you move the front of the GPS receiver around, uh, it updates all three measurements every single second. So in the lower left-hand corner of that screenshot, when you see a range of 2.76 feet and a bearing of 186 degrees and an inclination of zero, those numbers are updating constantly as you move the unit around in the field. So it's a great way to know that you're hitting the right point. Uh, of course, we do recommend that you take more than one shot to a feature when you're learning how to use this technology. We want you to build some confidence that it's giving you the right answers. So uh, we do recommend that you take uh, more than one shot to confirm that you're getting good repeatability in your measurements before you accept it. So to take the shot, you basically hit the camera button or you can actually hit this little icon right on the screen with your stylus. If you want to take the shot again, you can either hit this button down below. In the lower left, that's the dash button. It will reset the laser and disregard that shot. You can then take the shot again. And then if you like that shot, you can either hit the check mark in the lower right-hand corner, or you can actually press the button directly underneath that icon. Now, if you're using either ArcPad, ArcGIS Mobile, or TerraSync software to collect your data, it will automatically send that measurement data over to the program and automatically apply the offset to the point feature that you're mapping. This is a very important discussion to have when you're doing any kind of offset or using any kind of an external sensor to help determine where your features land. And it's called the total error budget. As we all know, if you're using a centimeter GO7X receiver, we have to assume that you have a minimum of one centimeter of error at the GPS. Um, then you have some error in the distance measurement, which is five centimeters. That's your 1.9 inches. You have some error in the clinometer, and you have some error in the compass. So the idea is you have to theoretically add up all these errors to determine what the final resting place of that feature will be. So the bottom line is we urge you to keep your distance shots as short as possible so that you can maximize accuracy. Now having said all this, uh, it may seem rather strange to talk about one centimeter of accuracy at the GPS and then start adding all of these errors. Obviously, you will not be able to maintain that one centimeter accuracy if you do offsets but it may be acceptable for that particular application depending on the accuracy requirements of that project. So this is something we've been recommending for years, um, and this will help you decide what kind of error that the laser, range, uh, the laser range finder module may impose on your offset points uh, that you can live with. And so here's what we recommend. You go out to an urban area, possibly, or anywhere where you can see a physical object like a hydrant or a post or some sort of a mark on the ground. Uh, collect that directly with your GPS receiver. So now let's assume you have a one centimeter location for that point. Then stand 25 feet away and shoot the same point, collect a second point feature. Then stand 50 feet away, shoot the same point, collect a third point feature, and then obviously stand 100 feet away, shoot that same point, and collect a fourth feature. So if everything was perfect, obviously, all four of those point features would appear on top of each other. But you know they're not going to. So as, what you'll be able to educate yourself on in this particular case is that the farther away you are, the more error you're going to have in that final solution. So it'll give you some really concrete uh, idea as to how far away you feel comfortable shooting based on the errors that you see. So here's something else that we need to talk about as far as when should you calibrate. Trimble does recommend that you calibrate the sensors every day. Um, you should not do the calibration in the office. 
because part of the part of the sensor calibration process is to calibrate the inclinometer and the compass. And of course, in a building, you have way too much steel and possibly too much ferrous metal, uh, which will certainly have an influence on the calibration process. So we do recommend that you go out into the field, you go to the project site, and before you actually start using the laser rangefinder uh, to do point offsets, that you should calibrate the sensor on site. Um, obviously, every area is a little different. Uh, you could be standing right on top of an iron ore deposit. Uh, obviously, we recommend that you don't stand close to vehicles, trucks, traffic control boxes, fire hydrants, anything that would have a direct influence on the compass calibration. Uh, only takes about 90 seconds. And when people hear about laser rangefinders, Sometimes they automatically think, oh, that's great. When it's raining, I can sit here in the truck and I can shoot my point feature from the vehicle. No, you really can't do that because it'll drive the compass crazy and it will typically result in some pretty significant errors in your offset. So let's talk about the GPS receiver or the GNSS receiver. Why are we talking about a centimeter? Um, as you may know, uh, most of the mapping world or the GIS data capture world has gone between usually 10 centimeters and 5 meters. And Trimble is a company that offers a wide variety of products between those two, ex those two extreme ranges of accuracy. And so for that reason, a centimeter was always in the realm of surveyors. And for the first time, and this has happened probably 14, 15 months ago, Trimble has decided to release a one centimeter unit for the GIS and data capture world. And the reason for that is some people that are involved in those project, uh, projects are actually demanding better accuracy. Um, so you actually can achieve this. And naturally, as uh, a person like myself who's been trained by surveyors for many years, you do have to make sure that you check into at least one control point sometime during your data collection day to confirm that you're getting the accuracy that you think you are. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to have one centimeter accuracy. Uh, you can do um, control for LIDAR projects. Uh, you can do staking and layout, depending on your application. There are still a lot of functionality that the Pathfinder, GIS, and TerraSync and centimeter world do not provide that a survey system will. So it's extremely important uh, that you know where the pitfalls are when you're using this product and that you use it correctly. So the accuracy rating is one centimeter horizontal and one, uh, one and a half centimeters vertical. And this assumes a lot of different things to be in place before you can achieve that accuracy. Um, the top of the line RTK survey system today, <clears throat> excuse me, from Trimble costs 25 to $28,000. And the same system in a mapping um, system or a Geo 7X centimeter system is about 16.5 and those are retail prices. So you can achieve this accuracy either in real time if you have the infrastructure in place around your project site or in post-processed. So the GIS workflow uh, is a solution that really offers centimeter level accuracy now, which is a nice thing, which means you can use programs like uh, TerraSync, which is the TerraSync centimeter edition, which gives you full access to your data dictionary, uh, your attributes, and your attribute values. Um, it uses Trimble Floodlight and Flight Wave technology for high productivity. Floodlight is a marketing term. And I know that some of you know what this is already, but let me explain this. Floodlight is a marketing term that Trimble came up with a couple of years ago. And it describes three individual characteristics. Uh, the first characteristic is that it does pick up satellite constellations other than GPS. So the original floodlight was picking up GPS and GLONASS. Uh, the newer version of floodlight in this new unit picks up GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Compass. So it picks up four different constellations of satellite positioning systems. Um, floodlight also includes special algorithms that are built into the receiver itself that smooth out lines when you're collecting line features and they smooth out the perimeter around area features. So these are smoothing algorithms that are built right into the system. And then the third uh, characteristic of floodlight is that there is an electronic barometer 
built directly into the unit itself. And of course, a barometer measures barometric pressure. And if you combine the barometric pressure reading at your specific location with the geoid model that is built into Pathfinder, or excuse me, built into TerraSync software, you can actually get almost the same vertical accuracy that you're able to achieve horizontally. So in the case of a centimeter unit, it will provide you one centimeter horizontal and one and a half centimeters vertical. So it's a pretty powerful thing. FlightWave is basically Trimble's name for the sensors that are combined in the laser rangefinder module. So it just really makes for a flexible workflow. TerraSync can be used in a two to five meter unit. It can be used in a submeter unit, a decimeter unit, or now a centimeter unit. So here's our first polling question. <clears throat> this webinar uh, does contain three different polling questions. I'll put this on the screen in just a moment. This question says, how much would you benefit from using a laser rangefinder to collect points? So as I launch this poll, please take a few moments and, and make a selection. And then when we're all done, I will share that poll with everyone. Okay, looks like everyone has voted. <clears throat> Let me close and then share this poll with everyone so you can see the results. Uh, it looks like only 10 to 20 percent of you would use it all the time or, or fairly often. Um, 50 percent of you would rarely use it. And that's actually great because now you really don't have to buy the unit with the laser rangefinder. Um, what's really interesting about this, and I think I confirmed this just last week, is for some reason Trimble only sells the centimeter edition of the Geo7X with the laser rangefinder. Um, having said that, it is a removable module that with two screws you can simply take off. Uh, you can leave it back in your office, and then when it comes time to use the unit as a standalone handheld to get less accuracy, uh, you could then reattach the laser rangefinder if, if you wish. So let me hide this poll and we'll continue. <clears throat> okay, so let's first of all talk about a single base solution. Let me go back here for a second. There we go. Um, you can get one centimeter of accuracy with this unit uh, if you're receiving corrections from a single base or you're deciding to apply post-process corrections back in Pathfinder office. The caveat to this is that base station can be no farther than 30 kilometers away, which is about 18 and a half miles. So that is a real restriction because, you know, many of us in the GIS world have lived uh, in the submeter world and even the decimeter world where we could be a hundred miles from our base, that's no longer possible when you're trying to achieve one centimeter of accuracy. So it is very important that if you're trying to get one centimeter and you only have a single base solution, that base station must be fairly close to your project site. However, if you are in a VRS environment, now, VRS is an acronym that stands for Virtual Reference Station. And a virtual reference station is actually a series of survey grade base stations that are placed uh, throughout a large geographic area like the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, the state of California. Uh, and there probably are about a dozen states or so in the country currently that have this infrastructure in place. And the way it works is that uh, you're out there in the field with your centimeter edition unit, and you are certainly inside of the geographic network that these multiple base stations are providing. In this particular slide, you see only three base stations, but that's simply for illustration purposes only. You can see that the guy is standing within the geographic space of this network. And here's how it works. Every single one of these base stations is collecting data from the same satellites uh, as you are as a, as a rover in the field. 
Every one of those base stations is automatically sending its data on a second-by-second -second basis to a computer, which is acting as a server someplace in the world. Uh, in the case of uh, Washington, it's being sent to a computer that's managed by Seattle Public Utilities. In Oregon, it's being sent to a server uh, managed by uh, Oregon Department of Transportation in Salem. And then if you're in the field and you can get yourself to the Internet while you're in the field, and that's the key to this system. Most people get to the Internet when they're in the field, of course, through a cellular modem. And that's where the cellular modem comes in uh, in these newer, higher-tech receivers. Uh, you pick up a position with your unit, and the position that you are acquiring in the field without any corrections is around 19 to 20 feet. That's a typical autonomous accuracy. So you're sending that raw position that's accurate to about 20 feet back to the server. The server then sees where you're located within the network, and it begins to then send you a customized correction file. Um, but because the accuracy that you sent to the server was about 20 feet off, it assumes that this virtual reference station is about 20 feet away from you. So as it sends this correction data back to your location, it's sending you data as if the base station is only 20 feet away from you. And that's a very significant process because there is a linear equation um, in the GPS uh, technology called the baseline error. And the baseline error basically says that for every kilometer of distance that you are between the base and the rover, you add approximately one millimeter of error. And that's referred to as a one ppm error. So if you're 20 kilometers away, that's 20 millimeters. If you're 200 kilometers away, that's 200 millimeters, which is two-tenths of a meter, which is about seven and a half to eight inches. So you can see where the farther away your base station is, the more error you're going to have in your final solution. And in this particular case, it's as if the base station is standing right in front of you. So because of the mathematical redundancy and because of the calculation built into this customized correction data stream, uh, the accuracy that you can achieve in the field in a VRS environment is simply astounding. We have customers working in Washington. Washington State, uh, who are receiving real-time corrections from the VRS up there, and they're getting elevations on the top of culverts. And this is basically just the Public Works Department to make sure that the elevation of their culverts is correct. Uh, and they're receiving one inch of vertical accuracy and 0.5 inches of horizontal accuracy in the field because of these redundant measurements that they're getting from the VRS. So pretty powerful. So where can you get one centimeter? This is a big deal, right? What kind of environment can you actually work in and achieve this level of accuracy? Well, the Geo7X and the Geo6000 are really carrier phase receivers, which means they're not just getting the binary code data from the satellites. They're actually collecting how many of these carrier wavelengths are there between your antenna and every single satellite in view. So in order to achieve one centimeter, the receiver has to confirm the count of how many of these carrier wavelengths there are, which means you have to see open sky for a minimum of two minutes. And I've actually had it take four and a half, five minutes, depending on conditions, depending on number of satellites. So that doesn't mean that you can't get anything other than a centimeter in worse conditions. It just means that you must make sure that the receiver can see open sky for a minimum period of time to achieve your accuracy. And then that accuracy will vary as you walk under different obstructions and walk near other obstructions. You do have to have an external antenna. And the external antenna recommended is the Zephyr Model 2, which happens to be a survey grade uh, antenna. Um, as I say, you do have to put in that minimum two minutes of time. And what's interesting is if you can put in the minimum required of time on point number one, and achieve your one centimeter, and then say you have collected that point. If you can walk to the second point of observation without losing lock with any satellites, then you can have that accuracy instantly at that subsequent point. It's only when you then walk under trees or walk next to a building that you may have to put in more time at the point that you collect after that. So 
some of the options to get this accuracy, as we sort of talked about, um, you can get either real-time corrections or you can get post-processed corrections in Pathfinder Office. Uh, TerraSync software currently supports all four of the real-time data streams, which is RTCM2, uh, actually 2.3, RTCM3, CMR, and CMR+. Plus. These are simply different data streams and different data protocols that base station managers have chosen to broadcast their signals over. So TerraSync supports all of those protocols. Um, you can also do something else. You can use um, a new thing called a uh, RTK base. And we'll talk about the RTK base and how to get real-time corrections in very remote areas as well. So what software solution should you use in order to get one centimeter? That, that the answer is really simple. You've got to use TerraSync centimeter edition software. Um, the reason for this is I think it's mainly a marketing decision, but ArcPad and ArcGIS Mobile do not support, even with Trimble positions, the one centimeter solution. You can get a decimeter with those other programs, but to get a centimeter, you must be using the TerraSync centimeter edition program. Uh, pretty important. Horizontal versus vertical. Um, TerraSync is the only software program that we just discussed of the three that is using what we call a geoid model. And a geoid model is a model of the Earth based on gravity readings, and this gravity model closely mimics mean sea level. Since all GPS receivers collect data according to height above ellipsoid, which assumes that the Earth is more like a beach ball, uh, the geoid model allows the software to take that ellipsoid height measurement and immediately, even in the field, convert it to a mean sea level elevation. So with the electronic barometer built into the Geo7X and with the geoid model built into TerraSync, you're able to actually achieve those high vertical accuracies even in the field. Now, if you don't have that geoid model in TerraSync, you can still collect data, but then you won't be able to achieve the good vertical accuracy until you process your data in Pathfinder Office. So there's a couple of different choices there. So as we said, ArcPad and ArcGIS Mobile, even with the Trimble Positions extension, does not support this centimeter level accuracy. So here's some accuracy charts to look at just for a second. Uh, you'll notice that even with a one centimeter handheld with no external antenna, it is still possible to achieve three centimeters of horizontal accuracy, which is basically an inch, and four centimeters of vertical accuracy. So it's even though you have the external antenna when you buy this entire kit, you can still use the handheld by itself. You simply won't get to the one centimeter, but it is obviously highly accurate. The tornado antenna, which is really recommended for the decimeter Geo7X, uh, will give you two and a half centimeters. And of course, the recommended antenna for the, the Geo7X centimeter unit is the Zephyr Model 2. And that's what will allow you to achieve that one centimeter horizontal accuracy. So here's our second polling question. Let me bring this up on the screen for one moment. This question says, obtaining one centimeter of accuracy would allow me to do what? So when that pops up on the screen, take a couple of seconds and, uh, and answer that question. Looks like we have about 80% voted. I'll just wait a couple of more seconds here, and then we'll close and share that poll. OK, so I'll close and share this. It looks like um, about 50% of you say it would provide a better solution for your clients, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, for those of you that have a GOXH 6000, those are also upgradable to a one centimeter product. So that just gives you an option there. 
Uh, 13% say provide control for LIDAR projects, uh, respond to contracts that require survey grade accuracy, and a quarter of you say everything, all the above. That's great. So thanks for answering that. So I'm going to um, make this disappear and show the screen for a second, just to make sure that it's there. And then we'll go on to the next slide. And this is the last couple of slides here. Thanks for your patience. Um, there is a way to get real-time corrections in a very remote area, but it does require that you pick up an extremely, at least a, an, an extremely weak cell signal. Because obviously the whole key to getting real-time corrections is to get connected to the internet in some way. And so part of this solution, and I'll explain this in just a moment, is really the Pacific Crest Radio. Pacific Crest is a company that's been around for a long time. They were recently purchased by Trimble several years ago, and they provide a radio that transmits on a very low frequency. It's the 403 to 473 megahertz, which is a uh, considered to be a terrain-following frequency. And so this frequency is able to travel over fairly long distances. And this is the radio that you would physically connect, hardwire it directly to your centimeter unit. And then on the other end of the equation, you would have what we call the Intuacom RTK bridge. And this is a little blue box that uh, does a couple of things. Number one, it has a built-in battery. It picks up a cell signal, and this is the significant part. It can see a cellular signal that is so weak that the antenna on your cell phone cannot see it because it's a very powerful amplifier and a very sensitive cellular antenna. So let's pretend that you're at a remote job site and you can park your vehicle sort of on a rise or maybe near the top of a hill where you have a better chance of picking up a cell signal and you confirm on this Intuacom RTK bridge that you are picking up a cell signal. So you put the unit inside your vehicle, you put the cellular antenna and the broadcast antenna on the outside of your vehicle and you lock up your truck. Um, what happens is this unit then begins to pick up a cell signal and rebroadcast corrections that you're actually getting to at the VRS computer and it will then rebroadcast that correction signal from this bridge over to the radio that's physically plugged into your GPS receiver. So it basically does still rely upon getting real-time corrections through a cell tower, but this particular product has a remarkable ability to pick up extremely weak signals and get that correction to your GPS unit. So here's a photograph of a guy who's out in the field. He's basically mapping this right-of-way on this transmission line. And in this case, uh, maybe for the photograph, he has the RTK bridge set up on a little monopod, sort of a tripod. And you can see that there's a cellular antenna and then a broadcast antenna. And then on the range pole where he's using this centimeter unit, you can see that he has the Pacific Crest radio, which is facing the camera. And the radio has to be hardwired directly into the mini USB connector at the bottom of the GO7. And that's what's feeding the corrections into his system. So giving you a slightly closer look at what that photograph shows, um, there's the RTK bridge and there's the Pacific Crest radio. So this is just a possible solution. Just as a side note, um, the RTK bridge is around $4,500 uh, and the radios are around $2,500. So that gives you some idea of what it would cost to, uh, to use this solution in a, in a highly remote area. So here's our last poll, and then we're going to wrap up this webinar. This poll says, um, if I used a one centimeter mapping system, I would be able to do what? So when that poll appears on the screen, uh, just take a couple of seconds and answer that. And then we'll open up this for any, uh, any questions you might have. By the way, while you're answering those questions, you know, uh, people still do this. They'll either rent or they'll purchase um, another GPS receiver or even a base station, and they'll set up a portable base station on site. So that's still a solution, although that does imply a whole series of complications to your project. 
uh, but it's still done you know, from time to time. So let me share this poll with everyone. It'll come up in just a sec. Looks like 22% uh, of you said you would rely upon real-time corrections via a single base. More of you said uh, post-process corrections. And um, about a third of you said either one or the other, which makes sense. Uh, it looks like the people that are attending may not be um, inside of a VRS or may not have access to that. More and more states are beginning to adopt that infrastructure. It typically takes quite a bit of time and obviously quite a bit of tax dollars to install these base stations and get them up and running. But it's true that someone within the state, typically a public agency, does have to drive the effort uh, to make it a possibility. So let me hide this. And once again, let me take the screen off for a second and re-show it just to make sure that everybody can see the screen. And then finally, um, our contact information. Um, we have my colleague Jackson Bigley. He's in our Missoula, Montana office. Chase Fly is in our Jerome, Idaho office. Uh, I, of course, am in the Portland office. We have Sean Minton, who is in our Sacramento office. And if you have any questions that you'd like to take offline after, this, after the webinar is complete, then please don't hesitate to call me or any one of these folks. And uh, if you call me, I can direct you to the right person. Uh, or you can call them directly. So let's open this up for uh, questions and just let me know if you have any questions. Give me a couple of seconds to take everybody off of mute and then uh, go ahead. Okay, I got everybody off mute. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Okay, guys. Well, hey, thanks very much for attending. Um, just want to let you put my contact information um, back up again, just in case you have any questions. Um, there it is. And I'll be happy to help you any way I can. So thanks very much for attending.